So I suspect that most of you know the story of Hansel and Gretel. Yes? So when I say Hansel and Gretel, I imagine that there are two images that come to your mind. Two things. One is the gingerbread house that the children, Hansel and Gretel, wanted to eat. And the second image is that of the witch who wanted to eat Hansel and Gretel. Would this be true, the most two popular thoughts? Well, there's a, a, a little less remembered aspect of this story that where it begins where their Hansel and Gretel are being led out into the forest where they will be stranded and Hansel knows this is about to happen and so he takes a slice of bread with him and as they walk along as the woodcutter delivers them to the middle of the forest he is dropping bread crumbs behind him so that he could find his way home after it's all, after they've been left stranded in the middle of the forest. Breadcrumbs. They are picked up by the birds, eaten by crows. Bread. The most basic necessity of life in this moment for Hansel and Gretel is eaten by crows. Bread. The most basic necessity of life. I'm reminded of a time that Jesus needed bread, that necessity of life. Jesus had gone into the desert right after his baptism. And Matthew tells the story like this in chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, for 40 days, Jesus wandered the wilderness like the Israelites did for 40 years. But Jesus had no bread or water. And the devil comes to Jesus to tempt him in that most trying of times. And Jesus replies with a quote by Moses, recorded in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Here, Moses is reminding the Israelites about everything that God had done for them in the desert. And he says, so he, he that is God, humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Interesting phrase, is it not? Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We just heard this morning how St. Vincent's Kitchen gives bread out to those who need this necessity of life. And we join by helping them. We take up an offering here today. We'll have, we have people in our midst who go there and, and serve, physically help out. So collectively, we help them to give the bread. And Jesus says to you and to me, humanity does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what are these words that comes from the mouth of God? Now to answer that, I want to tell you that Jesus is the bread of life. Those are his words. And I quote John 6. He is the bread that does not spoil. Jesus is the bread that is food for eternal life. He is the true bread from heaven. Jesus is the bread of heaven that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And God speaks. God the Father speaks and confirms that Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then verse 14... The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So Jesus is God's Word. Jesus is the answer to our question, what are these words that come from the mouth of God? Now, I could easily just wrap this all up with a story and say amen, but I actually want to give you three illustrations. And these three illustrations highlight for me how we take Jesus and we give him to others, especially to those who need him. And the manner 
of offering Jesus to others is through our words. Our words, which are Jesus offered to others. Our words, which are the words of God. Are you with me? Let me give you three illustrations that speak Jesus to others. You know how we often say or write to others that we will pray for them? Whether that was in person that you said that you would pray or, or at the end of an email or at the end of a text saying that you would pray. You know, we are often habitual in our declaration that we will pray. And I trust that you do, that you did. That in fact, you followed through and you prayed as you said you would. And then on the receiving end, it is good to know that we have been prayed for. There is something in knowing that we are being lifted up before God and that God is being petitioned on our behalf. There is comfort and peace in our soul knowing that we have been prayed for. But there is one thing that is even better than knowing that we are prayed for. And that is the experience of being prayed with. Whether it happens here after a service, we offer a prayer in the corner, or if it's in the prayer room, or whether it happens in your home or at the hospital room, the experience of being prayed with is wonderful. And I can tell you that when people are praying with you, it is them offering Jesus to you, to see him again, anew, afresh. Jesus who is that necessity of life offered up on your behalf, is now being offered to you. I remember a time when I was in a funk. I had, was downsized out of a job, and it was Sunday morning, and I went to First CRC Church in Calgary, and it was Stampede Breakfast. They have a Stampede Breakfast every year. Actually, the whole city puts on a Stampede Breakfast, but there at church, uh, before the service, they had this huge Stampede Breakfast, and I was in such a funk. I'm sure my face was downcast and standing in the middle of that crowd, I, I felt small. I felt unnoticed. I, I felt insignificant. But somebody must have seen me because this gentleman came over to me and he started to talk to me and, and, and he asked me what was going on and I shared with him the woes that I had. And then he prayed for me. He prayed with me right then and there in the middle of that crowd. And he lifted me up before God. And not only did he lift me up before God, he took his big hands and he put them underneath my chin. And he lifted my face up as he prayed so that I could see Jesus. As you can tell, I never forgot that moment. and How he prayed and what it did for me and how rich and wonderful that was in that moment. So may I encourage you that if you say that you are going to pray for someone, would you be so bold as to do it right then and there? I know it's going to take a little bit of courage, but if you do that, they will be blessed. You might say in that moment of prayer, I was blessed, and that's exactly what I want to talk to you about next. Blessing someone. We say around here that we are blessed. Right. So how do we bless others? And more to the point, how do we bless others with the words of God? Now, you might wonder... <laughs> Am I even allowed to speak a blessing to others? You know, I mean, isn't that the pastor's job? You know, he's the one. He, he can raise his hands, right? Well, yeah, yeah, that's our practice. It's an unwritten policy, if you want to call it that, that only the pastor can raise his hands while pronouncing the blessing and the greeting at our worship services. But speaking a blessing? Speaking words of God? No. I'm not the only one who can. Each and every one of us can. We are a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We are Christ's ambassadors given the ministry of reconciliation. And as priests, 
set apart by God to represent him as ambassadors sent to represent God, we are empowered to speak on behalf of God and bless others in the process. So what does blessing someone look like? Well, let me first say that it is a lot like praying for someone and it is different than praying for someone. The sameness is that you are speaking words, but they are not words of petition, knocking on heaven's door, so to speak. Rather, they are words of affirmation. They are words of affirmation that goodness and mercy are available to all from the very words of God. And we speak these words not from a position of superiority, but from humility and gratitude. You see, we ourselves must first be grateful to God for his blessings to us. And then in that place of gratitude, we seek God's words to speak to another. You remember Elizabeth, cousin to Mary? Elizabeth said to Mary, why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? <laughs> That's humility. And then comes a blessing. Elizabeth said next, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her that will be accomplished. <laughs> I often wonder, how did she even know what was said to Mary in that moment? So I suggest to you that you begin with thanksgiving to God for the privilege to bless others in his name. Then seek God's will for the person that you seek to bless. What do you believe that that person needs in order to flourish as the person, uh, to be the person that God has called them to be? Ask God if he wants, what he wants to, you to speak to them. And then speak it as if it is a gift that you are handing over to that person. Flourish. That's the key word for blessing someone. Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. So what does that person need to flourish in life? What do your children need to flourish in life? Well, what about your close relative? What about your parents? Your neighbors? Your co-workers? What do these people need to flourish in life? When I was a chaplain at a hospital, I was uh, called in and asked to meet a gentleman on the 10th floor. The 10th floor, <laughs> that's the cardiac unit. The gentleman who had just asked for a chaplain to come visit him was having heart problems. I went up to his room and I met him and it was a room with three other people and he was a little uncomfortable about talking with everyone looking around and so he says, is there some place private where we can go? I said, well, there's not a whole lot of places. They took out the waiting area. That Let's go down the hall, find out. So we walked down the hall, and we found a storage room. It was full of equipment and furniture all stacked up, but I clicked on the light, and I closed the door, and we took two chairs and put them against the wall, and we sat there in the storage room. And he looks at me, and he says, so what kind of minister are you? And I said, well, I, I'm a minister within the Christian Reformed Church. You know, might have heard of it. We call it the CRC for short. He goes, yeah, uh, I know about them. I, I left them a long time ago. Oh. Uh, so what do you do for a living, I asked him. What, what, what fills your days? He says, well, I just retired from 30 years of being the director of the Young Canadians. The Young Canadians is a dancing, singing troupe that perform at the Calgary Stampede every year. It's a highlight um, every night of the stampede, uh, they perform. And, and it's a wonderful show, but he was the director for them for 30 years. And then he proceeded to tell me that he was now just remarried, a second wife, and he loved her so. And as he spoke those words, he then said, I'm scared. He says, tomorrow morning, uh, my, my, my surgery was planned for 10 a.m., and, and they just phoned me and told me that I, I, my surgery is going to be at 7 a.m., and here it is now 9 p.m., and I, I, I'm scared. And he says, can you bless me? So I asked him to open his palm. And then with my hand, forefinger, I, I drew a cross in the palm of his hand, and as I 
drew the cross on his palm, I said, you are in the hands of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is he that will go with you into the surgery. And when you wake, you will see your wife. I then closed his hand. And then I said, tomorrow, when you're lying on that table, about to go into surgery, I want you to remember that you are in God's hands. And he looked at me and he says, you're not bad for a CRC guy. <laughs> Blessings. They are not wishful thinking. Nor are they hopes couched in prayer. They are declarations that God is for us and that we are in God's hands. Which now leads me to the final way in which we bring the words of God to others. Anointing. Anointing is done when we seek to put the mark of God upon others. Anointing has been used in the scriptures as a means of dedicating someone to God for his care and his protection. Prophets, priests, and kings were anointed. They were set apart. They were made holy for God. In Luke 4, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit to preach the good news. In Acts 10, Jesus, it says, was anointed with the Holy Spirit to heal the sick. In 2 Corinthians 1, believers, it says, are anointed by God as if God seals his ownership on us. And in James 5, sick people are invited to ask for anointing by the elders, for healing for their illness and for the forgiveness of their sins. And we, it says in 1 John 2, we are anointed for learning and for truth. And so the third way that we bring God's words to others is by anointing them. Anointing is a practice done here at Hope Fellowship Church. Our prayer coordinators have been anointing people as they pray for them. Often, we have offered anointing to sick people, and they reserve the right to accept or decline. But we have. We have anointed persons with illnesses because they have asked us, just as it says in James, if anyone among you is sick, let them call upon the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Jesus, our one necessity in life, offered in the anointing of one another. Now, typically, when I anoint someone, I do so also in the threefold name of God. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the, the one God who claims you as his own, who says to you, you are mine. <laughs> you, I will not let go. You belong to me. Strong words from a strong God. Strong words from a loving God. Anointing is an outward manifestation of an inward reality. You see, in this way I convey that whoever I am anointing, that they are a child of God, well-loved and cherished. These are the most basic words of God. It's that we are loved by Him. We bring these words to others by prayers spoken, blessings imparted, and anointing that dedicates and restores. These are the very words of God that God offers to us all. And that's exactly what we want to do here this morning. We, the elders and the prayer coordinators of Hope Fellowship Church, invite you to come forward to be anointed to remember that you are a child of God. And so if the elders could come forward and set up a little uh, chair on either side of the table, and they'll sit on one side, and you'll be invited to come up and sit on the other side, and we'll do that in an orderly fashion. But, but here's how we're going to do this. First, if the worship team wants to come up too, they may as well. First thing to do is I invite you to think of one aspect in your life that you desire from God. 
be it to rise up from despair or to overcome fear. Maybe your prayer is for confidence or boldness or faith. What is God asking of you in this moment as you face the life that you face? So please take a moment to think of this one thing and then give it one word. One word only. What is it? Maybe it is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What's that one word for you? Then when you have that one word, I invite you to come forward and to receive anointing. Come sit by an elder or a prayer coordinator. Tell them your one word and then offer them your open palm. They will anoint you and they will bless you. And you are invited to do one of several things with your hand anointed. You can close your hand and hold on to that promise of God with you. Or you can bring it to your nose to, to breathe in the sweet aroma of God. Or you can take your hand and bring it to your heart as a, as a symbol of that which you just asked a blessing for. Or you can take your hand and bring it to your neck. If you remember that the neck, the nephesh, is the representation of our spirit, our soul. Or you can take your hand and you can bring it to your head as a sign of the cognitive nature of the blessing that you desire. And then we ask that you simply return to your seat as there are others that will be waiting in turn for their time to be anointed. Music is going to continue to play while the anointing is going on. Are you ready to come forward? with your one word. Come as you are compelled. Come and be blessed.